Hello, this is uh, Ben Zeller, co-general editor for Nova Religio, the Journal of Alternative and Emergent Religions. And today we are talking with Dr. Kelly Hayes, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at IUPUI, the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. We are talking about her article in Nova Religio, volume 23, number three, Western Esotericism in Brazil, the Influence of Esoteric Thought on the Valley of the Dawn. Uh, and she might also mention, perhaps in passing, she's also written for us on volume 16, number four, Intergalactic Space-Time Travelers, Envisioning Globalization in Brazil's Valley of the Dawn. Uh, so those watching this uh, may want to um, download and read both of those. Uh, so Dr. Hayes, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so for those who haven't read the article yet, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. So the article is about the Valley of the Dawn, which is a religious movement that is known primarily for its very elaborate and very colorful costumes and the very elaborate and colorful uh, temple complex that it has outside of Brasilia. And it's also known for being incredibly complex and syncretic. Um, one scholar called it an abstruse mashup of various esoteric threads. So my uh, contribution looks at Mario Sassi, who is a kind of overlooked figure in the Valley of the Dawn. He was the founder's partner, and he is the one who's primarily responsible for creating the theology that allowed this movement to reproduce itself over time without the presence of the charismatic prophet who was the founder, whose name is Anton Neva. So I look particularly at the influence of esoteric thought and literature on Mario Sassi. And in my research, there's not a whole lot written about the Valley of the Dawn in English, but there is a fair amount of research on it in Portuguese. And what I found out is that while people mention the influence of theosophy, nobody had really dug into that. And I realized uh, doing the reading on theosophy, which I was not particularly familiar with before starting this project, how very influential theosophical ideas had been in the development of the Valley of the Dawn's theology. So the article looks in particular at the influence of that literature on Mario Sassi and how it allowed him to synthesize a number of different ideas and movements to create the intellectual framework for the Valley. How did you uh, get into studying this topic, the Valley? I started studying the Valley. I first went there in 2010, and I went there on kind of a lark. Um, I had just finished another long-term project on uh, Brazil, a Brazilian form of voodoo, basically, um, sometimes called macumba. And that had been a really um, kind of heavy topic. It's a religion in which there's lots of animal sacrifice and ceremonies in cemeteries at midnight and um, I was looking in particular at some very controversial entities that are associated sometimes with the devil. So at the end of that project, I was feeling like I needed a palate cleanser, so to speak. And I had heard that there were some people who worshipped crystals down in Brasilia and wore fancy costumes. And I thought, oh, that sounds good after all of this night, you know, midnight in the cemetery and um, animal sacrifice stuff. So I went down there in 2010 for the first time and I was absolutely captivated with the Valley of the Dawn. It turns out they do not worship crystals at all. Um, and the more time I spent there, the more I realized how really incredibly complex this religion is on any number of levels in terms of its cosmology, in terms of its material culture, in terms of its bureaucracy, um, it's really one of the most complex religions I've ever studied, actually. And so I feel like I could spend another 10 years. Um, and in fact, the past 10 years, much of my time has been spent just trying to figure out what is going on at this place. Because sort of at any particular point, you could dig in, say the costumes, for example, and then spend a year trying to understand all of the different symbols and all the different colors and all the different ways they communicate various ideas through the costumes themselves. Neat. So what has surprised you the most uh, during this research on the Valley? 
I think the complexity has surprised me the most. Um, I've really come to appreciate how the Valley of the Dawn works on a number of different levels for different people. So for lots of people I've talked to who um, aren't interested in, you know, the intellectual stuff about theosophy and, and, you know, basically some of the more abstruse points of doctrine, the Valley simply functions as a way for them to understand their present life um, and to work on improving their lives while helping others. And so Valley members consider themselves Christian. They have a very esoteric understanding of Christianity that focuses mostly on Jesus um, as an evolved spirit. And so for you know people who are just interested in having an uh, an explication for why they're suffering in this life and what they can do about it. The Valley works on that level. But for people who are interested in complex issues related to doctrine and theology, you know, they could spend a lifetime um, gnawing on some of the knots uh, in the Valley's theology. And so I also have come to appreciate, I think, that um, people like to dress up. And in the Catholic Church, for example, it's only clerics that can dress up. It's only the elite. And at the Valley of the Dawn, everyone can. And there's something really powerful in that, um, really powerful in putting on this garment that um, allows you to step outside of your everyday reality and experience something different. What would you say are the uh, most important sort of big picture ideas that have come out of your, uh, your work on the Valley? Um, I've been thinking about that question, actually. I, I mean, I think for the article, um, the present article on Mario Sassi's contributions, I realized uh, that we could talk about the Valley of the Dawn as an example of Western esotericism. Mm -hmm. So that whole literature on Western esotericism doesn't talk about South America uh, or Brazil at all. And so I think it could open a new front, so to speak, in, in that, um, area of academic study, um, looking how, at how very old esoteric ideas have circulated in perhaps surprising places and how different groups in different times have used those ideas and integrated them with their own local realities. So part of the argument in, in my article is that we can look at the Valley of the Dawn as an example of Western esotericism. I think another thing that surprised me in, in writing this particular article was how influential theosophy had been on Mario Sassi. I didn't find any evidence that he read um, Blavatsky, for example. I think his exposure to theosophy was mediated through some other literature, but he's definitely drawing on concepts like root races and the masters of wisdom and sort of reinterpreting them and placing them in this other narrative <clears throat> that involves extraterrestrials uh, and that also involves Brazil as sort of a, a privileged spot. Makes sense. So this article just came out in our February 2020 issue, um, but I know we've been working on it for a while. So are there any updates that didn't make it into it, that uh, late-breaking um, uh, updates? You know, there, there really haven't. I feel like I really exhausted uh, the whole Mario Sassi angle. I was fortunate enough to interview two of his surviving children, mm -hmm. which gave me a whole new perspective. And I came to realize that if you read the English language work, but also the Portuguese language work on the Valley of the Dawn, all of it focuses on Aunt Neva, who was the founder, mm -hmm. who was a charismatic, definitely visionary figure, um, and certainly critical for the movement. But I have come to think that Mario Sassi was also a very important, and that the movement would not have survived her death and maybe wouldn't have even grown as big as it did during her lifetime without his contributions. Uh, so I think, if anything, um, that sort of corrects our understanding of how the Valley was, it has been able to reproduce itself and perpetuate itself and grow. And in fact, it's an international religious movement today with temples all over the world, including the United States. 
Makes sense. As, as someone who's also studied a group with two founders, one of whom is usually ignored, I, I completely get it. Yeah, yeah. necessary corrective. Well, um, and also I think, you know, it's, it fits a, pa a standard pattern, right, of sort of a charismatic woman founder who relies on a man, on the sort of male intellectual systematizer kind of figure, um, which seems to be the case for Heaven's Gate, yeah, yeah. right, but also a number of other different movements. Yeah. So for people who are interested in kind of the history of how new religious movements emerge and reproduce through time, I think it's interesting to note that pattern. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, the way in which women's leadership is sort of intersects with, with gender norms within the, the host society and what the expectations of members and, and potential members. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, what are you working on now? I, this is part of a book length project, right? It is, yeah. So I am finishing my book, which is going to come out with Oxford University Press on the Valley of the Dawn. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, I struggled for quite a while for how to write about this complex religious movement, like what angle I wanted to take on it. And the, the structure I finally came up with looks at different aspects of the Valley of the Dawn's material culture through the stories of key people in the movement. So Aunt Neva, of course, Mario Sassi, of course, mm -hmm. but also the artist who's been principally responsible for the iconography of the Valley of the Dawn, mm -hmm. one of Aunt Neva's daughters, who mm -hmm. was the first seamstress, who was responsible for creating the costumes and who still is still alive and who still is very concerned with maintaining the standards for the different costumes and the symbols, um, but also looking at people who come to get healed. Mm -hmm. So talking about their stories. So this structure sort of lets me talk about, um, give a, uh, what I think about as like a 360 degree view mm -hmm. of this religion and its various facets, but also how it has changed over time what it was like during um, the years of its founding um, and how that has changed. That reminds me of the way that Karen McCarthy Brown structured her Mama Lola, which I found one of the most engaging ways that, that, that she wrote it, the way you get to know the, the individuals as an entrance into their sort of their lived experience. Yes, absolutely. I was also really inspired by George Packer's book, mm -hmm. The Unwinding, mm -hmm. which again is trying to treat this very complex phenomenon um, really of the decline right of the American dream if I can oversimplify it but through these the stories of various people where you can really see right how this big thing that's so hard to wrap your brain around is operating at the micro level in different people's lives so it's been a really challenging project it's been a really fun project um, it's been a project that I feel like writing it has been a puzzle so it's not been straightforward um i i've been writing in little chunks and um you know rearranging them and putting them in different places because the the how you control the flow of information i think is important because one can very quickly become overwhelmed by the valley of the dawn as many people are well, great well thank you so much dr kelly hayes for speaking with us at nova Religio. thank you so much for having me